people often tell you to do what you love. It's not always easy to find what you love. It involves trying lots of things, finding out what your interests are. There are people that sometimes help you and put you in a good position to try new things and to find out what it is that you love so you can continue doing it. There are some people, however, that can be hurtful in that process. You see a cafeteria, that's the cafeteria, the gymnasium, and the auditorium that was in my elementary school. So I didn't just eat breakfast there, I also played basketball there, while the smell from breakfast lingered. And then we had assemblies there. My principal welcomed us as first graders to that school. There were six-year-olds filling that cafeteria. The message was, welcome to the school. We were all excited. We were excited by the closing line of the speech that the principal gave. And it said, I have a college scholarship waiting for each and every one of you. And then came the caveat. As long as you don't have a criminal record or a baby by the time you graduate from high school. Keep in mind that she's talking to six-year-olds. Now, it's not unusual for a teen pregnancy or someone to have a brush with the juvenile justice system in any given high school. I had a hard time accepting that among the sea of mostly black and brown faces in my elementary school that there was a concentration of potential criminals and teen parents. And I rejected that label. I thought that the message from a principal should be uplifting, something that you can do, not what you should avoid doing. You can be what you want, find what you love. That was what I was looking for, so I had to do it myself. I had a lot of other interests while I was in elementary school. Some of them were labeled for boys or for girls, but I rode bikes with boys and girls in my neighborhood. I played with dolls. I played basketball in the cafe gymatorium a lot, and I learned music on a recorder, which many of you might have done. I also tried sewing when I was in elementary school. And this Cabbage Patch Kid doll named Charles, I did what you might expect, of an eight-year-old at least. I put him on a piece of fabric, traced his outline, cut two pieces of those fabrics out, and sewed it together. The problem was I failed to take into consideration that he was three-dimensional. <laughs> he did not fit in that outfit that I made. So I, I knew that I wasn't out of the gate. I didn't have the intuition to be a top sewing expert, but I keep trying. I make my kids with my wife. We make Halloween costumes now, so I did get better. But there was a path for me to get started on a lot of different things in elementary school. I was able to try the music and the athletics, and there are some paths that are well traversed by young people, that there are youth leagues and learning how to play piano or learning how to start reading music by playing the recorder or playing sports. And these are things that you get to do throughout your life, all the way to a profession or a pastime. You could be in a band, you could be in an adult league of sports. But there are some activities that aren't always available to young people, at least when I was growing up. Personal computers were considered for adults. A lot of the machines that you saw in the 80s were made for calculating spreadsheets. But a few of them were made for young people to learn with. And I used an Apple IIe, the one, is the one you see behind me, to learn about history and geography as you got to watch oxen pull a wagon from Kansas to Oregon with the Oregon Trail. A couple of my friends, I lost them along the way to various <laughs> Uh, uh, diseases, but that was all a virtual game that was very engaging. I also learned working with math and number munchers, multiplication activities on this computer. I learned grammar, and there were software to help me do a lot of things, but one piece of software I want to tell you about was the basic programming language. In middle school, I also had Apple IIe's, and the basic programming language was something that allowed me to tell the computer what I wanted it to do, program the computer. And it's called basic because it looked a little like this. You can make a list, like a recipe for if you're cooking something, and your numbered list, what you want the computer to do first. In this example, it's welcoming someone to the computer, 
asking them to give you some input. Press one of the keys, you have options. And then doing something with one of those options. If you press three, good luck to horse number three. Now, horse number three may not look like a horse to you, but keep in mind that I only had green dots and a black background on the computers that I grew up. So that was a horse to me. All right, so just bear with me, imagine. There were three copies of that horse, and I made a game called Horse Race when I was just learning how to program the graphics of these Apple IIe computers that were available to me. In the horse race, I learned how to make things happen randomly on the computer. Each horse would run a random number of steps when it was their turn. Some would run farther, some would run shorter. That was up to the computer. And then, at the end of the race, there was a magical command that was something like flip vertical or rotate. And the horses that didn't win the race, they would flip upside down and protest. <laughs> Have you ever seen a horse do that? See, but in my world, that could happen. And that happened because of the power of programming the computers. And I loved to do this. So I sought opportunities to program wherever I could. In the Portland library, I would go there to use the computers as well because I wanted to do this activity outside of school because the school is only part of your day. And I found that even though there was a price tag that made it so that most computers were inaccessible at homes, once computers start to get a little older, people would phase out their old ones. And I was able to buy one of the old computers from this very library and walk out of those doors with a computer that's as big as I was for $5 for the computer and $5 for the monitor. It wasn't the fastest computer, but it got me where I needed to go. And where I brought it home to in Portland, Oregon, was on the north side of this picture. There's a river that separates the north side and the south side of the city. On the north side, there are, it's where a lot of the people of color lived in the city, where there's an income disparity between the north side and the south side. And I made a decision from going to schools in North Portland for my elementary and middle school that I wanted to get exposed to more people, and I made a choice to go to a magnet school on the south side of this bridge. At orientation, there were people that are meant to welcome you into the school. I convinced some of my friends to go to the school with me. From my elementary and middle school, I took a small crew, and at orientation, we were greeted with the message to go back across the river. So somebody thought that it was a great idea when we were bright-eyed to show up for high school to give us a message that you're not here, you're from the other side. We still ignored that label and continued to go there and have a lot of fun. And at that school, I was close to a lot of resources. And I had another set of computers that I could play with. And you know what I was going to do. I was going to sign up for every computer class I could when I was at the high school. And it was taught, my first course was taught by a math teacher. And he had a lot of responsibilities. So sometimes he would be missing an action in class. And he would take long breaks to handle some stuff in the school. And in that break, I would fill in and teach the class. Because I knew a little bit from the three years of middle school. And I wanted people around me to learn it as well. And so I was doing what I loved and sharing it with others. And during one of those times where I was in front of the computer class as a sophomore, someone from the central office came in and said, can anyone here do a web page? I need a favor. And keep in mind that the web was new back then, right? So it involved making an image on the screen and having some text. It doesn't look like the internet does today, but that was in my wheelhouse. I said, sure, I can do that, and we can use it as a lesson in the class. So I made the person a web page for the office, and later on, I came to find out that the person from the office was in the job placement portion of the office in my high school. And right across the street from my high school, there was on the second floor of this building, a small software company with three people that said, we'd like to hire a standout senior from your school to come intern for us. So I was a sophomore at the time, but I had just done a favor for the job placement office. And they said, go on over there. So there was the label of, we want a senior. But I showed up as a sophomore and said, can I have the job? I showed them a few things, and they said yes. So I was able to earn a job as a programmer in high school and what was cool about that was that most people at my school had to park on meters and feed the quarters, but I had a parking space right there. <laughs> so moving that senior label out of the way and making room for a sophomore means I got to take advantage of that for multiple years. That was something that helped me gain admission to college. I didn't wear the label of valedictorian in my school. Somebody else took that. 
but I did have a portfolio of programs that were out in the world. From having multiple years of experience, I could say in my college essay that, hey, I make cool programs. A little cooler than horse races that flip the losing horses upside down, <laughs> things that help you out in the hospital. And that's a cool thing to be able to put on an essay. That was rare back then, but as a professor now, I read a lot of amazing things from the students coming in and the things that they're creating. But rewind 20 years, and that was something that allowed me to get into college, where I was met with some other labels that I had to deal with. I enrolled in computer science at the University of Southern California. And the difference between these two pictures was hard for some people to reconcile in my case. There was a school with a very prominent athletics program, and there was a very prominent engineering program. And my, some of my professors, I had many great professors, but I had some that were giving me somewhat of a compliment, which is asking me, are you going to need time off from the class to go to games or for practice? And that was making an assumption that I was there for my athletic prowess and not for my academic standing, or not for the things that I had done in the engineering field. So that's a great compliment to be considered as one of the world's most elite athletes. However, it became a chore when too many people had that impression without getting to know who you were and put that label on you, then people are thinking when it's time to work in groups for a class and you have to form your own groups that this person may have to be excused to go to away games, so I don't want to work with that person, or that they're there mostly for athletics and don't have the same interest or fully developed um, skill set that I do. And so that was problematic, but overcoming that label, I was able to find great people that you can work with and I spent a lot of time in the computer lab, and unfortunately, I missed watching some of the football games because of that, but you know, it helped me get to where I am. And somebody else that helped was Intel Corporation. Intel recognized some of what I was doing on campus because I continued teaching others what I love to do, program computers. Similarly to how the library allowed me to get an old computer for next to nothing, I did that on my college campus. There were people giving away old machines, and I put labs up for people that were learning how to program to, if one computer lab was busy, there were other labs that they can go to. And Intel appreciated this and recognized my efforts by giving me a full scholarship, not for football, but for my computer science abilities. And that helped me because they also provided funding for me to do a master's and a PhD to go to more school and learn more about what I loved doing. So this was a great opportunity to bring me here to Boston and I studied at the MIT Media Lab, which you see in the picture here. The Lifelong Kindergarten Research Group was working on the programming language Scratch that some of you can play with right outside. And this was uh, the team that was bringing Scratch to the world so that people didn't have to work with just green dots on a black background like I did. To program computers, now someone that was interested in horses on a screen could make their own virtual stable. And they can use multiple colors to draw their own horse and choose several things that one would want to do with it, like groom it or ride it. And if you interactively move the brush across the horse, it will love you and make these hearts. And so these are programs. Mango Mania put this up online and shared it with people around the world. So they didn't even have to be in the same computer lab. You can get ideas and remixes and share with a community of people that love what you love with the Scratch language, and you're not typing in the commands like I showed you from the keyboard and writing them down. You're using the blocks that you see on the screen and snapping them together like Lego pieces. And that was something that I was very proud to help with so that young people could explore many different interests and maybe find things that they love in doing animations or making games or simulations. There was a person in Boston that had a label from an unexpected person. This quote that you can read behind you that I'll help you uh, read was from a 12-year-old in Boston, an immigrant of color, that her father said to her, you can't work in technology. You're not a male, you're not white, or you're Asians. And they're the only people that can get rich off of that. So she dealt with this as a 12-year-old from her own father. How do you parse this? As a young person, where somebody that you think is going to put you in the best position is telling you something that you shouldn't do. And it might have been she could only rationalize in an article that she wrote. This came out in one of her local papers because she found her passion as a writer. And she wrote about her experiences. She was 
thinking that maybe the father just didn't want hurdles in her way or some of the things that I told you that I had to experience, you didn't want her to go through that, so was just trying to protect her. But she said, you know, that's one label, father. I'm going to put on another label. I'd like to do this. I'm going to join a program that is at the south end of Boston, which was one of the programs that helped Scratch get out into the world. It was called Learn to Teach, Teach to Learn. And you see teenagers going to work with technology and programming, but doing way more than that. They are learning from each other how to do make products, make digital graphics, make earrings, make furniture, and they're teaching people around them. And so that's where I learned how to help young people not just learn programming, but find a lot of different things that they love. And that's what I'm doing today, which is at the college, the Olin College of Engineering. I'm a professor of computing and innovation, and I have students that will help someone that says, a 13-year-old will come to our lab and say, I'd like to be an inventor. I have an idea. And we'll come up with a way to do some engineering that will help them get that idea out of their head into the world. And that helps people find their interests and find a tribe of people that will help them get to where they need to go. And so I want to leave you with the message that sometimes parents, principals, or professors might have a view of you that is helpful, and if it's hurtful, just consider it one of these hello name badges, and you could peel it right off. And I want you to instead think about what it is that you love and write your own labels. So as you can see, people may have considered me as a six-year-old as a potential criminal, but I wanted to replace that with Amon Milner, TEDx speaker. And when you're done writing your new labels, I want you to take the pen and pass that message on to someone else so that they can leave behind the labels that aren't helpful and write their own. Thank you.